Dr. Laura Riley is here right now giving a very important update on the Zika virus. And this can be so challenging, I think, for the OBGYN community because there is such an evolution and so much is changing with regard to the Zika virus. But let's talk about here and now what the ACOG guidelines are. Well, the ACOG guidelines follow the CDC guidance, um, and we've worked very closely with the CDC to make sure that we're translating their guidance clearly to obstetricians. Um, at the moment, what we're suggesting is that for women who either travel to places where uh, Zika virus is um, uh, locally spread, or women who live in those areas, uh, they should see their obstetricians, they should identify themselves. So we actually really have to ask the questions, have you been exposed? Um, and if a woman says that she's been exposed, um, depending on the timing of that exposure and whether or not she has symptoms that we're concerned about, uh, we offer her testing. And the testing, the testing algorithm is sort of in flux right now. Um, there's new data suggesting that a urine PCR might be even better than um, the serum PCR and um, the, the IgM testing. So um, I, would, I would tell people to look out um, for newer guidance as it comes along, but some element of testing would be helpful. That testing though takes some time. So in the meantime, if you know that their pregnancy is advancing, what else can you do in the way of ultrasound to try to see if the, the baby has in fact been affected? Right, so I think the other thing is is to, you know, obviously schedule women for an ultrasound some three to four weeks down the road so that you can see if there's been any kind of neurologic damage, um, you know, as a result of the infection. Um, the tough part is, as you know, um, something like microcephaly or some of these other neurologic abnormalities that have been seen may not be seen right away, in which case that may require follow-up ultrasounds, which have been suggested you know, every three weeks or every four weeks, depending on what you see initially um, and you know, what your index of suspicion is. You mentioned microcephaly, and I know that that's something that has been put forth quite often associated yes. with the Zika virus, but there truly are these other neurological consequences. What might those be? Well, some other things like lysencephaly, other um, brain malformations um, have been noted, not just the small brain. So it's important to get the ultrasound and obviously do head circumference and try and be sure that it's you know associated with the appropriate gestational age, but it's also important to look at the intracranial um, structures. Um, I think the other thing that has been uh, noted is there have been women who have had miscarriages um, potentially associated from you know, Zika um, infection as well as uh, stillbirth, late-term stillbirth. So um, you know, it's important uh, for us to follow these women once we find out that they've either been exposed or, uh, even worse, uh, live in an area with ongoing um, infection like Puerto Rico and, and the Virgin Islands. But those areas may be changing. In fact, the CDC recognizes the fact that the Zika virus carrying mosquitoes may be moving up through the United States this right. year. So is there another conversation that is important before people are exposed that might actually help them to prevent getting infected? Right, so I think the answer at this point, because there's no vaccine and there is no treatment, um, really all we have is prevention. So I think that you know, women who, are, who insist on traveling to these areas, which is unfortunate, or if you just happen to live in one of those areas, it's important to take as many precautions as you can, wearing bug spray with DEET, wearing long sleeves even during the day because these, are, these mosquitoes bite during the day. Um, you know, try and you know, clean up your, your housing areas such that you don't have standing water, you have sh um, screens on your windows, um, those kinds of things, air condition as much as you, you know, possibly can. Um, so all of those things, I mean, we need to um, counsel women about you know, taking those precautions. And I think also one other thing that's really important for obstetricians to sort of offer to women is that you know, we have pre reasonable data to suggest that um, bug spray with DEET is safe in pregnancy, because I know that that's, that tends to be a, oh, I can't possibly use that, but we know that that is the one thing that will prevent these you know, mosquitoes from biting. So it's, it's, it's definitely important information. So that might be the lesser of two evils. And then the other, Absolutely. do you think it's important for OBGYNs to be telling their patients not to travel to areas that are affected by Zika? I certainly think that you have to have a conversation with patients because you know, at the end of the day, if someone goes to one of these areas and comes back, there's nothing we can do other than monitor their pregnancy. 
And we're, you know, that's, that's a lot of, that's months of worry potentially for some of these women. Um, you know, if the testing comes back and it's negative, that's reassuring, but at this point, we don't actually know that that's 100%. Um, and so some women are still gonna worry until their baby's out. It's such a critical topic. Dr. Laura Riley, thank you so much for your expertise. Thank you.